Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about polar coordinates. Previously, whenever we've talked about the location of a point on the plane, we've described its horizontal and vertical distance from the origin, right? X and Y. How much we go out horizontally, how much we go out vertically. We call them rectangular coordinates because if we look at a horizontal and a vertical put together, we're just drawing out a rectangle on the plane, right? So they're called rectangular coordinates. Now we're going to look at a totally new way to talk about coordinates. We're going to talk about polar coordinates. This gives us a new way to describe the location of a point. Instead of using horizontal and vertical components, we can talk about the point's distance from the origin, right? Distance from the center and the angle that it's on, what angle the point is on. So this gives us a whole new way to talk about location in the plane. Using it, we can create graphs the likes we've never seen before. We'll explore these in the next lesson, polar equations and functions. For now though, let's work on a strong understanding of just what polar coordinates are and how they work. We really have to have a good understanding of how polar coordinates work so that it's an intuitive thing before we'll really be able to use it in equations and functions. So let's get that under our belts in this lesson. All right, we plot points with polar coordinates using two things are the distance of the point from the origin, how far we are from the origin, and from here on we're going to call the origin the pole. So the center of the graph will be called the pole now since we're talking about polar coordinates, and in a little while we'll see why it makes sense to be talking about the pole, and there is sort of vaguely a connection between North Pole and South Pole like we normally hear the word pole show up when we're talking about the poles of the Earth. All right, next we've got theta, the angle of the point. So theta, the angle the point occurs on. We measure this counterclockwise from from where we used to have the positive x-axis. So our positive x-axis used to go out to the right, and we measure counterclockwise from that, just like we measured angles in the unit circle, right? On the unit circle, we always measured angles by going counterclockwise from that positive x-axis, right? We always spun counterclockwise, so it's a lot like when we worked with the unit circle in that matter. We give points as the ordered pair r comma theta. So it's distance first, then angle. Distance comma angle. It's normally assumed that theta is going to be in the unit of radians. Degrees are used occasionally in polar coordinates, but much, much less often. For the most part, unless you see it really explicitly shown otherwise, that there's a degree symbol or something else to make us definitely sure we're talking about degrees, just assume it's radians because that will be the usual thing we're talking about when we're using polar coordinates. All right. How can we visualize polar coordinates? When we plot in rectangular coordinates, we usually think of a point x, y in one of two ways. The go left, right by x, right, how much we go horizontally, and then how much we go vertically, go up, down by y. We do these two things and we get to some location. Alternatively, we can do the go up, down by y first. We can do that first, our vertical motion first, and then our horizontal motion. But we wind up getting to the same location. Either way is fine. Both go to the same place. Likewise, there's two ways to visualize polar coordinates, so let's see both of them. First, we'll look at visualizing r then theta. So the first thing we do, we can go out a length of r from the pole, what we used to call the origin, the center of the graph, directly to the right, right? So if we've got, here is our center where I'm holding this holding this ruler. So here is our center, and what we do is we have some distance r that we then go out to the right along from that pole. So we go out a distance of r to the right from that pole. The next step is we rotate the length counterclockwise by whatever our angle theta is. So we spin that length that we just put out by that angle. So we spin out that r by that angle. And so we wind up having the same distance r here, right? This distance here is r. That's what we're winding up seeing is we've just put out some distance, and then we spin the distance. And combining these two things, we arrive at some point r comma theta, some distance comma angle. Alternatively, we can visualize theta then r. So first we rotate counterclockwise by theta, and we create an imaginary line at that angle. So we spin from that right x-axis, what we normally used to call our positive x-axis, but now it's just going right from the center. We spin up some angle theta, right? So we'll have as this little stub, we spin up some little stub, and so this going off in this direction is now going off in the angle theta. Next, we apply going out a distance r, so we then go out in that direction some distance r, and we achieve the point. We achieve our point r comma theta, right? We're already at some angle theta, right, this imaginary line right here, and then we just wind up going out the distance of r. We go out our distance r along that direction, and we wind up getting out to r comma theta, right? 
we spin, and then we go out to the distance. Either of these two ways are just fine for visualizing polar coordinates. They both work perfectly reasonably. Whichever one makes a lot more sense to you, that's the way I'd recommend visualizing it. For me, personally, I prefer this method. I think it's easier to think in terms of what do you spin to and then how much you go out to. But if you think it's easier to think go out distance, then spin, all the power to you, go ahead and use whatever makes sense to you. Also, now that we've got some sense of how polar coordinates work visualizing it, we can also see why we call them polar coordinates, why the idea of a pole makes sense. Imagine if you were standing standing on the North Pole. If we want to talk about any location on Earth, well, we could talk about it as you stand on the pole, you face in some direction, you just choose a direction arbitrarily to face in, and then we can talk about every location on Earth as being how far you spin and then how far you walk down to get to that location, right? Some place in South Africa, you just spin some angle and you walk down to it. Some place in Uruguay, you just spin to some angle and you walk down to it. Some place in America, you just spin to some angle and you walk down to it, right? Wherever you're going to go to, it's starting at some pole, you spin around that pole, and then you walk a distance. Or alternatively, you can walk a distance and then, you know, spin around effectively to some different longitude. Depends on how you want to approach it, but I think it makes a little more sense to do spin than walk, and so I tend to visualize it that way. All right. Polar graph paper. So normally when we graph rectangular coordinates, so rectangular coordinates, we think in terms of these tick marks on the axes, right? One, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three, positive one, positive two, positive three, negative one, negative two, negative three, to help us see horizontal and vertical distance, right? We can easily see at this point here, we've got a distance of two horizontally and a distance of two vertically. But horizontal and vertical tick marks aren't so useful for polar, right? How far is the distance from here to here based on these tick marks here and here. We can't figure out how far we are from the center, how far we are from the pole based on these locations of these tick marks for horizontal and vertical tick marks. So for polar, we need a new way of marking our graph paper, marking our graph so we can see things more easily. We do this with concentric circles. So we use concentric circles to help us see distance from the pole. So the first circle, at least in this graph of concentric circles, concentric just means one and then another round around that, another round that, and so and so on. So this first one would be at a distance of one. Anything on this circle is a distance of one from the pole. This next one, anything on this circle is a distance of two from the pole, right? That way we can see easily how far you are by just seeing which circle you're on or which circle you're closer to. So it's like tick marks, it's like horizontal and vertical tick marks, but instead it's for how far you are from the center of the graph. It's a new way of talking about it, which works really, really well for the R of R comma theta, right? For the R in a polar coordinates, the distance from the center, it works really well to think in terms of these concentric circles. Similarly, we need some way to be able to think about the angle theta. So we use as a reference way, we can talk about the angle theta with arc sectors. That's lines coming out of the origin. So in this, we've got like lines coming out of the origin here, and here, and here, and we continue around in this way out. We see that it's cut a total of 12 times, so an entire revolution, an entire revolution would be two pi. So an entire revolution cut two pi divided by 12 times that it's been cut, so that'd be pi over six for each one. So here's pi over six, and then pi over three, two pi over six, three pi over six would be pi over two, and so on and so on and so on. So we can see the angles here. Right, cutting it up into these arc sectors lets us see, oh, we're on this angle here, oh, we're on this angle here, oh, we're on this angle here, and the concentric circles lets us see our distance easily from the center. So this works really well as a way to talk about polar graph paper, a way to easily see where we are on a polar graph. Now, we don't necessarily have to format our graph with concentric circles and arc sectors. Just like we don't have to use tick marks when we're using rectangular coordinates, right? We can make a graph that doesn't have any tick marks on it and still probably understand what's going on, but it often makes it easier. It'll make it easier to graph things, so it's useful to have it. Not absolutely necessary, and there'll be some times where it's not worth it for us to put them down, but if we're trying to be really careful with a graph, it's a good idea to sketch these in first so we can be really accurate when we're drawing it out. Something that's special about the polar coordinates is that unlike rectangular coordinates, there are multiple ways to name the same point. So there are multiple ways to name a single point in polar coordinates. So what do I mean about this? Well, notice that the point 3 comma pi over 4 winds up giving us the exact same location as 3 comma 9 pi over 4. So they're both going to wind up being out at a distance of 3, right, on this third circle here. So we can see that they're both going to wind up being the same distance out, but why are they on the same angle? Well, think about this. Pi over four 
winds up being here, but we can break 9 pi over 4 into 2 pi plus pi over 4. So 9 pi over 4 is just the same thing as 2 pi plus pi over 4. So what we've got here is 9 pi over 4 is effectively spinning the first 2 pi. It's making an entire revolution, and then it's doing the last pi over 4 to wind up being on this angle, and then it puts the same distance out, right? So our first one is pi over 4 at a distance of 3, but then the next one is 9 pi over 4, so it just makes an entire revolution for the first 2 pi, but then that last 2 pi of, sorry, the last part of 9 pi over 4, after that 2 pi will just be an additional pi over 4, so it winds up being at the same angle. So we wind up getting an equivalent point for polar coordinates. So this is something special about polar coordinates. We can wind up sort of lapping any given theta way, any theta that we can talk about a specific angle, we can lap it by adding 2 pi or adding multiples of 2 pi. This means for any angle theta, any angle theta that we give in polar coordinates, we can make an equivalent angle by just adding or subtracting a multiple of 2 pi, right? You add 2 pi, you just do one loop clockwise. Sorry, counterclockwise. You add 4 pi, you do two loops counterclockwise. You add negative 2 pi, you do a loop clockwise, right? However you wind up adding a multiple of 2 pi, whether it's adding or subtracting it, you wind up just getting back to where you started so it has no real effect. Just like when we worked with the unit circle, right? 2 pi and 0 are the same angle on the unit circle, so adding or subtracting 2 pi has no effect on our location in terms of angle. If we want to avoid this, if we want to avoid being able to accidentally loop and show up at the same angle, we can restrict our theta to be between 0 and 2 pi, so it's allowed to be 0 inclusive, but not allowed to get up to 2 pi, since 0 and 2 pi match up. But often we won't actually make this restriction. We very often won't use this restriction. It sometimes can be used, but very often we'll be allowed to go larger than 2 pi, and we are allowed to wind up looping multiple times and then landing on the angle we're actually going to wind up using. So we can have this restriction, but very often it won't be put on. So don't think that it's just going to always show up. There's also another idea we can talk about. We can talk about negative values for r. So when we talked about the idea of r, we just talked about r representing how far out we are, but we never required it to be positive. If it's positive, that makes sense. We go to some angle and then we go out by r. But we need a way to interpret negative values for r, because what if our r wasn't positive? What if we wound up having a negative value for r? So if we have a negative value for r, we do the following. If r is negative, so if r is negative, we go in the direction opposite the one that angle theta points out. So for example, in this one here, we've got negative 2 comma 3 pi over 4. So the first thing we do is we go the angle, we spin the angle to 3 pi over 4, right? And that goes off in this direction here. But then we have negative 2, so instead of going off in this direction, we go in the opposite direction down to this way. So the negative says go in the direction opposite that the angle does, right? So it's like we're spinning to some angle, but then we wind up going in the opposite direction like this. We spin to some angle, but then we wind up shooting in the opposite direction by whatever our r's absolute value is. Alternatively, this is the way of thinking spin then go out distance. If you really prefer thinking in terms of distance out then spin, you can think of r as going left, so a negative r, so here would be a negative 2, r equals negative 2 would go like this, and then we just wind up spinning the same thing, just like normal, counterclockwise to 3 pi over 4. So as opposed to positive r coming out, right, positive r coming out from our pole like this, we wind up having negative r come out the other way, and then we just wind up spinning like usual to whatever our point winds up being. So this means there's yet another alternative way to name the same point. We can add pi to the theta and then make r negative. Why does this work? Why does this wind up giving the same point? Well, imagine that we had some point we normally got to with some theta and some r, right? Some theta, some r distance out. Well, if we add pi to theta, we wind up spinning to the opposite direction. But then if we make r negative, we push back in the opposite direction once again, so we wind up getting back to our original thing, right? Pi to theta puts us in the opposite direction, but negative on r puts us in the opposite direction. Opposite, opposite means we're back where we started. So combining these two things means that we have yet another way to express the same point. So that's something we really have to keep in mind. When we're working with polar coordinates, we don't know that there's not just one way to call it a point if it's simplified like there is when we're working with rectangular coordinates. We have to think about, could this be the same thing as something else? How about converting between rectangular and polar? At this point, for a point in the plane, we now have two ways to name it. We can talk about the rectangular x, y coordinates, how far we go out horizontally, how far we go out vertically, but we can also talk about 
the polar coordinates. How far we go out distance from the pole, how much we spin that angle, right? The distance out we go r, and then the angle that we spin. So how can we convert between the two coordinate systems, right? They both wind up calling out the exact same point up here. So how can we convert between the two? Well, let's just layer both of them down simultaneously. So if we look at both systems mapping the same point, we see they're both mapping the same point. So now we just want to see how do they relate to each other through this diagram, through this picture. Another thing to point out is that since it's a rectangular coordinate system, we know that it has to have a right angle in the corner because it's based on a rectangle, right? A horizontal portion and a vertical portion means that where they meet, they've got to have a right angle right there. So we wind up seeing a right angle in the triangle we've made with R, X, and Y. Hey, great, so a right triangle, what we've got here is something we can apply, we can work with using basic trigonometry. So looking at both systems simultaneously, we can connect through basic trigonometry, right? This triangle right here has an angle in the corner and has some right angle in the other corner, some angle, the angle theta in this corner has the right angle in this corner, so this is a perfect chance to use basic trig, right? Good old stuff that we've been learning since geometry. So let's start working through these. We can relate theta to our other information. So cosine theta would be equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. So that gets us cosine theta equals x over r. Sine theta is going to be equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So that gets us sine theta equals y over r r squared equals x squared plus y squared because of the Pythagorean theorem, right? The hypotenuse squared is equal to the other two legs squared and added together, so we've got r squared equals x squared plus y squared. And finally, tan theta, if we take the tangent of theta, then that's the opposite over the adjacent, so that means tan theta equals y over x. Great. So we can use the following equations to convert between coordinate systems. We figured out where they're coming from. So at this point, we can go polar to rectangular. We had uh, cosine theta equals x over r. We just multiply both sides. So we get x equals r times cosine theta. Similarly, y equals r times sine theta. On the other direction, rectangular to polar, we had r squared equals x squared plus y squared and tan theta equals y over x. Great. Converting to rectangular is easy. If we want to convert to rectangular, all we have to do is plug in r and theta, and we will automatically get the right x and y, right? You just plug in r, you plug in theta, you crank the numbers, and you wind up getting out what your horizontal x is, what your vertical y is. That part's pretty easy. Converting to polar, though, is a bit trickier. So we can't tell if r is positive or negative, because it's r squared equals x squared plus y squared. So r could be negative, r could be positive, x could be positive, y could be negative. The squareds are going to wind up turning everything into things that look positive, so we can't tell if it winds up being positive or negative from its equation. Worse, the function tan inverse can only output from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Remember, the arctan, the tan inverse function, only outputs on this side of the unit circle. That was one of the things that we talked about when we talked about when we learned that in trig. So tan inverse can only output from negative pi to pi over 2. And this is a problem because since we've got tan of theta here, if we want to figure out what just theta is, we're going to have to use tan inverse on the way to figuring out what theta is, right? If we're going to crack tan theta and get to theta on its lonesome, we need to use tan inverse. We need to use arctan on both sides. So that means we'll wind up being restricted to just seeing one side. So converting to polar is this kind of difficult thing. r squared equals x squared plus y squared. We don't know if r should be positive or negative from that information. Tan theta equals y over x. We don't really have a great way to talk about it. If it's in the very first quadrant, it's easy. But if it's in any of the other three, things get a little bit trickier. How do we deal with this? To get around these limitations, make sure you always Always, I'm serious about this, draw a picture whenever you're converting from rectangular to polar coordinates. So pictures are the way we're going to solve this issue. The picture does not need to be extremely accurate. It doesn't need to be a perfect picture, but it needs to be clear enough for you to see which quadrant the point you're talking about is in, and it will give you a sense of what angle to expect, a sense of what things should come out to be, right? It will be a sanity check that make, lets you see, oh yeah, my uh, answer is possibly right or my answer is obviously clearly wrong. So it lets you have some idea of what's going on, and we'll see how useful this is in example four and example five. Of course, it wouldn't hurt to draw a picture when you're converting to rectangular either. More pictures, never a bad thing, but it's not quite as necessary. Still, a visual aid always helps, so I'd recommend first couple times you do this, draw a picture, it'll help you see what's going on and see the relationship between rectangular and polar coordinates. 
All right, we're ready to talk about some, uh, some, some examples. All right, so plot the points below. We've got this nice thing here, this nice diagram with concentric circles and uh, lines, arc sectors to cut things up. So let's just mark out what all of our arc sectors are here first. We see that there's a total of 12 pieces it's been cut up into, so it means our first angle will be zero. Here is pi over six. 2 pi over 6, so pi over 3, 3 pi over 6, pi over 2, 4 pi over 6, which will be 2 pi over 3, 5 pi over 6, just 5 pi over 6, 6 pi over 6, which will just be pi, 7 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6, 4 pi over 3, um, 9 pi over 6, which will be 3 pi over 2, 10 pi over 6, which will be 5 pi over 3, 11 pi over 6, and we now wrap back to 2 pi, so we're back where we started at 0. Okay, so with that in mind, we can see how to plot points. Let's start plotting points some points. So, first point, 2 comma pi over 3. So if we're on 2, we'll be on the circle, the concentric circle representing length of 2. We go out to angle pi over 3, that's this one right here. So length 2, sorry, distance 2 from the center, not length 2. So distance 2 from the center and angle of pi over 3 means that's our point right there. Next one, we'll mark in blue, 1 comma 225 degrees. So like I said, degrees are sometimes used in polar coordinates. They're pretty rare, but we can deal with them. We can work between radians and degrees when we need to, but for the most part, we'll wind up sticking with radians, but we do have to know how to deal with it. Where would 225 degrees appear? Well, 180 degrees, that gets us to pi, right? Pi is at 180 degrees, and then another 45 degrees will get us to 225 degrees. So another 45 degrees would be along this angle right here. So we're going to just cut this arc sector right down the middle. The other arc sector is in 30 degrees, so we see we split down the middle between this one. We're at a distance of 1, so we're going to wind up being here on this arc circle, sorry, this concentric circle, and we have that point right there. Next point in green, 3 comma negative 5 pi over 4. So if it's negative on our theta, that means instead of going counterclockwise, we will go clockwise. So negative 5 pi over 4, so that means we're going to go pi, we spin 2 pi here, and then we go an additional negative pi over 4. So we spun negative pi, that's clockwise pi. And then we spin an additional negative pi over 4. So that puts us splitting this arc sector smack dab the middle. So we wind up having a distance of 3 away from the center. So 1, 2, 3, third circle out. And here is our point right here. Next one, 2.5 comma 7 pi over 6. So 7 pi over 6. We mark out that one will be this angle right here. So here we are on this one. What is 2.5? Well, 2.5 is just going to be halfway between 2 and 3. So halfway between 2 and 3 looks to be right around here to me. And that's our point. Next up, we will go back to red, but this time we will mark it with a star after we get the point down. So negative 4 comma 3 pi over 4. First thing we do is we spin to 3 pi over 4. So here's pi over 2, and then is here's another pi over 4. So we are on the same angle as when we figured out negative 5 pi over 4. That makes sense. Negative 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4. Together, they're making sort of a total, they're meeting in the middle of a 2 pi, a way of thinking about it. So negative 4 means we're going to go not out on this angle, but in the opposite direction, right? Negatives tell us to go in the opposite direction. So we're going out negative 4, so 4 out in the opposite direction. We are on the fourth circle. We are here. And we'll mark that with a big star to help us see the difference. Final point, 3 comma 1.47. So this is probably the hardest point of all. Since it doesn't have a degree symbol, we know that 1.47 is in radians. 1.47 radians is an angle but what the heck is 1.47 radians, right? I don't know how to do very well with a decimal form of radians. I'm used to pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 6, things like that, right? So how do we deal with 1.47 radians? Well, one way is to just get some reference points, right? Some reference ideas, what do those other, what does pi mean in decimal? What does pi over 2 mean in decimal? Well, pi, that's about the same thing as 3.14, right? Pi over 2 is about the same thing as 1.57. So that means pi over 2, if it's at 1.57 and we're going to 1.47, that means we're going to be most of the way to having made it to pi over 2. If we want to have an even better idea of what it is, we could divide 1.57, sorry, we could divide 1.47, the angle we're going to, and then divide it by pi over 2, which winds up being about 1.57 when we plug that into a calculator. That comes out to be 
around 0.94, which means we are 94% of the way to pi over two. If that's confusing, just think in terms of 1.57 is here and I'm going to 1.47, so it's going to be roughly most of the way, but we can also think of it as a ratio so we can get this decimal, which is basically a percent. So we can think we are 94% of the way from zero to pi over two. So 94% of the way, that means we're gonna be mighty close to it. We are at a distance of three, so we're pretty darn close to being right on pi over two. So call it about here, and that is our last point. Great. Next example, in polar coordinates, name each point below. Then give two alternate ways to name them, and where one, one of them will have r less than zero. So first we see this is at what distance? Well, here's the one circle and the two circle. We do have to make sure that the uh, the um, scale for our circles winds up being one, two, three, right? We could have the scale be five, 10, 15, just as we've had tick marks on the axis be more than just one for each tick mark, right? We could have 20, 40, 60 be the scale on our tick marks. But in this case, we see that two does match up. So the second circle does match up to a, a two distance, fourth circle matches up to a four distance. So here indeed is the five. So we have R equals five. We're at a distance of r equals five. What's the angle that we're at? Well, we're on this and we can see that it's cut into pi over six. So this is pi over three. So we have theta equals pi over three. So our first most basic point, the one we would normally call out, will be five comma pi over three, right? A distance of five from the center at an angle, a counterclockwise spin angle of pi over three. Whoops, I accidentally meant to write pi over three. Didn't mean to write pi over six a second time. So we're at pi over three there. Now, remember, we can talk about any of these points in multiple ways, because if we spin an additional two pi, we wind up just getting to the same place, right? Here, if we're at this place, and then we just spin another two pi, we're still at the same place. So we can just add an entire rotation onto it. So we'll take theta equals pi over three, and now we can just add, so pi over three plus two pi, what's that wind up being? That winds up being six pi over three plus pi over three or seven pi over three. So we can make another point to call this out with as five comma seven pi over three. Alternatively, we could also, if we want to get r less than zero, the last part of this problem requires us to get the less than zero value for our r, right? Because we can always go in the opposite direction. So what if we'd spun to the opposite direction? So if we'd spun to the opposite direction, well, this would be an angle, a total angle for theta of four pi, four pi over three. So at opposite angle, so opposite theta winds up being four pi over three. So the opposite r, well, normally our r is equal to five. So if we're gonna to go to the opposite direction, right? We wanna have an opposite and then another opposite stacked on top of it so we can go back in the direction we want to go. So that would be negative five. So put those two things together and we have the point negative five comma four pi over three. So we've got our normal sort of canonical way, the way we would usually talk about this, five comma pi over three. But then there's other things where we've just done an additional rotation, five comma seven pi over three, or when we spin in the opposite direction and then go in the opposite, opposite direction, right? We spin in the opposite direction, then we go in the opposite, opposite direction by having that negative value for r. All right, next up, let's look at the blue dot. So where would this wind up being? Well, we see that it's at a distance, the circle is one, two, three, so we've got r equals three for our normal way of talking about it. What angle is it at? Well, we see that it's along this angle here, right, which splits evenly between, splits the entire quadrant evenly, so you split quadrants on pi over four to get from here to here it would be pi, so an additional pi over four would be five pi over four, so our normal theta would be equal to, sorry, five pi over four. So the normal way to talk about this point would be three comma five pi over four. Great. However, we can also talk about this different ways. Remember, we can go any addition of spins around. So any number of two pi is added to the theta and we'll still wind up being at the same place. So if our normal theta is equal to five pi over four, we can add any multiple of two pi and that's just that many times that we spin around, right? Whatever the multiple is, how many times we spin around. So if we want to spin around five times, we'd add 10 pi, five times two pi. So we can take five pi over four and we can add 10 pi to that. What does that wind up coming out to be? That winds up 45 pi over four. So we've wound up spinning to the five pi over four and then we just go one, two, three, four, 
5, and we land back right where we had been previously. So we've got another way of talking about this point as the same distance, 3, comma, but now we have a totally different angle for it, 45 pi over 4. Great. And our last point, where r is less than 0, where we wind up going in the opposite direction. So we wind up going in the opposite direction. Well, the easiest way to call this out would be, what would the opposite direction? Well, we're splitting the quadrant this way. We could talk about this as being pi over 4. So that would be pi over 4 here. And then we're going, if this is the direction we normally go, so opposite direction, so the opposite theta is pi over 4, right? We can see 5 pi over 4 minus pi or plus pi winds up getting us to an opposite direction. So 5 pi over 4 minus pi gets us pi over 4. Or if we'd added pi, we'd be at 9 pi over 4, but 9 pi over 4 is still the same direction as pi over 4. So two different ways of talking about it. Both are perfectly fine. So pi over 4 and then the opposite r. Well, our opposite r, normally our r is 3, so if we're going to have the opposite r once we're going the opposite direction in our angle, we want to have negative 3. We put these two things together and we wind up getting negative 3 comma pi over 4. We have our angle pointing us in the opposite direction, but then the negative in our r tells us walk the opposite direction. Opposite, opposite means we get to the point we wanted to be at. All right. Third example, convert the polar coordinates to rectangular. So our first one is 8 comma 5 pi over 6. For this one, let's start off by just drawing this, sketching real quick about where that would wind up showing. So 8, a distance of 8, 5 pi over 6, well, we wind up spinning to somewhere out here, right, for 5 pi over 6, and then a distance of 8. So we're something like that. So we don't know for sure what the point's going to wind up coming from that, what the point is going to be from that drawing. But we do at least have a sanity check that whatever we wind up getting, it should be in the second quadrant. We know that our y should come out to be positive, and we know our x should come out to be negative, right? Negative x, positive y, if we're going to be in this quadrant right here. So if we're going to be in that quadrant, we've got some sanity check to help us out here. Now, what are the formulas? Remember, the formulas for figuring out our rectangular coordinates from polar is x equals r cosine theta and y equals r times sine theta. If you ever wind up forgetting these, you can pretty easily just figure them out by drawing that triangle, the x, y, r, theta in the corner, and you can draw it out, figure it out. All right, so let's work through this. So here's our r, and here's our theta. So that means x is equal to 8 times cosine of 5 pi over 6. We work with the unit circle. We remember that cosine of 5 pi over 6, so 8 times cosine of 5 pi over 6, is negative root 3 over 2. Negative root 3 over 2. So we're going to wind up getting negative 4 root 3 is our value for x. Okay. Other one, y. y is going to be equal to r sine. So what's our r? Our r is 8. Might as well write that in. So 8 sine of our theta is 5 pi over 6. Remember on the unit circle, so now we've got 8 times sine of 5 pi over 6. You're looking on the unit circle, we get positive 1 half, right? It isn't below the x-axis yet. So 8 times 1 half, we get positive 4. So our y is equal to positive 4. So putting these two pieces of information together, we wind up getting the point negative 4 root 3 comma 4. If we wind up looking against the point that we figured out here, that seems to make sense. That checks out, right? Because we see that it winds up having more x distance than it should have y distance based on 8 comma 5 pi over 6. So this seems pretty darn reasonable. It checks out for at least a quick sanity check. All right. Next one, negative 5 comma negative 7 pi over 4. So let's draw what this would wind up looking. So negative 7 pi over 4, well, that's going to spin clockwise as opposed to counterclockwise. So we spin negative 7 pi over 4. That would put us at the same angle as having spun positive 5 pi over 4. So we're out here. But instead, we're going negative 5. So negative 5 will actually go, as opposed to going the normal direction of this way, we will wind up going in the opposite direction. So we are going to be some point out here at negative 5. All right. So we see how that works. So we've got some sense that we should at least wind up being in the third quadrant. We should have a negative x value and a negative y value. Same basic thing to figure this out. x equals r cosine theta. Our r is negative 5. Our cosine is negative 7 pi over 4. If we're not sure how to take cosine of negative 7 pi over 4, we could remember that negative 7 pi over 4 is equivalent to having written it as just pi over 4, as we can see from our picture, another reason why pictures are useful. So we could write this as x equals negative 5 cosine of pi over 4. Cosine of pi over 4, we check the unit circle, we get x equals negative 5 times root 2 over 2. And we've got 
x equals negative 5 root 2 over 2. Basically the same rundown for working through negative 5 sine of 7 pi over 4. Negative 5 sine, sorry, negative 7 pi over 4. We work that through. Once again, we will have negative 7 pi over 4 is equivalent to having written just pi over 4. So y is equal to negative 5 sine of pi over 4. We also could remember that since we are splitting a quadrant, it's going to wind up just being the same thing as it was for cosine. y equals negative 5 times root 2 over 2, just like we got for cosine because we're splitting that first quadrant. And so we get y equals negative 5 root 2 over 2. Combining those two pieces of information together, we now have the point negative 5 root 2 over 2 comma negative 5 root 2 over 2. And if we were to compare that to the picture that we originally drew just to give us a quick idea of what's going on, yep, that seems perfectly reasonable. Negative 5 root 2 over 2, negative 5 root 2 over 2, that is in the third quadrant because both our x and our y are negative. And we see this point here splits the x and the y pretty evenly, which makes sense because we're based off of splitting a quadrant. So it makes sense that our x and y values will wind up being the same. So passes the sanity check. We have a pretty good check to see that we're probably right. All right, next example four, convert the rectangular coordinates to polar and give your answers with r greater than zero and zero less than or equal to theta, which is less than two pi. So this is a restriction to just require us to put our, um, put our answers out in that normal form of positive r and thetas that aren't crazy large or negative, right? It's fairly normal restriction here that we might have this sort of thing. Not necessary, but it doesn't really hurt us or make this problem much harder to do. So first thing we wanna do, we always, always, always want to do this. When we're converting from rectangular to polar, always, always begin by drawing a picture. So first thing we do, we draw a picture. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but we want to have some sense of what's going on here. And also we'll see how drawing a picture can be really useful for figuring out the numbers. So we've got negative three horizontally and then three root three vertically. So here's negative three out this way and three root three out this way. Okay, so what were our formulas? They were r squared equals x squared plus y squared, and tan theta equals y over x. If you remember earlier when we talked about these, I warned about how it's dangerous to just use them blindly without thinking about them. We are going to now use them blindly just so we can see how we have to be careful and why it's so important that we pay attention to this picture. But if we had just used them blindly, then we would wind up having r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So our negative 3 and 3 root 3 are x and y. So r squared is equal to negative 3 squared plus quantity 3 root 3 squared. So we've got r squared equals positive 9 plus 3 squared is 9, root 3 squared is 3, 9 times 3 is 27. So we've got r squared equals 36. Take the square root of both sides and r. We know that we can't have a positive, we know that we can't have a negative r, so we know that it has to be positive, even though we get that plus minus technically, but generally we'll leave it as positive. So r equals 6. Great. So we figured out our r distance. That doesn't seem so problematic. Well, let's try using the tan theta equals y over x. Great, let's toss it in. So tan of theta equals our y, 3 root 3 over our x, negative 3. Okay, so we see that the 3s will cancel and we'll wind up having negative root 3. Great, we take the arctan of both sides, take the arctan of both sides, you punch that into a calculator and you wind up getting negative pi over 3. Wait, what? But that doesn't, what? That doesn't make sense, right? How is that possible? How can we get negative pi over 3? If we go back and we look at our picture, this is our theta right here. This is our theta. This here, this is not the case. That does not work out. That, that, that doesn't make sense. What's going on here? Well, this is why it's so, so important. We have to be talking about a theta that is in the part that arctan cannot talk about. Arctan talks about this side of the unit circle. But the point we want is over here on this side. So arctan can't get us to our point. So here's what we do instead. We wind up looking at this as just a normal triangle. If it was just a normal triangle, then this would be a length of three. We don't have to worry about negative three because we're not talking about coordinate, we're talking about the length of the side. And this would be three root three. And now we can talk about this angle in here as being alpha. Then tan of alpha would be equal to the opposite, three root three, divided by the adjacent, 3. So we'd get tan alpha equals root 3. We take the inverse tan of both sides. Inverse tan of root 3 is pi over 3. So we get pi over 3 from this. However, this is alpha, 
not theta. What we want is theta, and what we've got here is the alpha inside of it. But how can we figure out what theta is? Well, if we were to draw in the axes, the theta we want is this guy here. We figured out what alpha is. Well, how does theta and alpha connect together? Well, this here would be pi in terms of the angle. So what we've got is we've got that theta plus alpha is equal to pi for this specific picture. And now how these two things will relate depending on the picture we're dealing with. So we really have to keep our wits about us and think about what we're looking at. If we just try to do it blindly, try to rely on some formula, chances are we're more likely to make a stake, make mistakes than to actually be able to figure it out. There's a lot of things to have to memorize because it's so many special cases. But if you wind up making a picture and thinking about how does this angle connect and paying attention to the unit circle, it's not that hard to do at all. So theta plus alpha equals pi. We just figured out that alpha is equal to pi over three. So we've got theta, plus pi over 3 equals pi, which means that our theta must be 2 pi over 3. And that makes total sense over here, since that's 2 pi over 3. And inside of the triangle is pi over 3. We add those together, and we'd have the entire top arc from here to here. So that makes perfect sense. So we've now got, here's our theta. Figuring out the r still didn't cause any problems for us. That is r6. And so we've got the point. We put these two pieces of information together. And the distance is 6, and the angle is 2 pi over 3. And I hope this drives home why it's so, so important to figure out how this stuff works if we're converting from rectangular to polar, why it's so important to draw a picture. If we don't draw a picture, we're going to get lost in the middle. You really have to draw a picture. It doesn't have to be complicated, but we need that picture to help us figure this out. So 6, 2 pi over 3. Also, if we were to draw that as a picture, where would we get? Well, 2 pi over 3, that would wind up being out here and a distance of 6 about here. Hey, compare that to what we got here. That's pretty good. Seems to pass a sanity check. Seems like we probably got the answer right. Great. Convert the rectangular coordinates to polar and give your answers with r greater than 0 and 0 less than or equal to theta less than 2 pi. Basically the same problem as previous, but now we've got 17 comma negative 19. So new points. First thing we do, we always draw a picture. Now at this point we've understood, we understand how useful a picture is. So we're going to draw a jumbo sized picture because now we can just work on the triangle inside of it now that we see how this thing works. So 17 would be out here, negative 19 would be down here. So this is a distance of 19. It is negative 19 as a coordinate, but we can also just treat it as being a distance of 19. Here is a distance of 17. Our r is going to be this side of the triangle. Remember, it's a right triangle. And we know that not theta. Theta is not inside of the triangle. Theta was the counterclockwise spin like this. This is our theta. What we've got inside of the triangle is some other angle. I'm deciding to call it alpha. You can call it smiley face. You can call it any symbol you want to use. Alpha is an easy one for me to draw. So I'm calling it alpha inside of the triangle. So we can figure out r pretty easily. It's just a right triangle. We can figure out alpha pretty easily. Basic tan, basic trig function, tan theta. And then we can use theta and alpha's interaction together to figure out what theta has to be. So first off the bat, let's figure out what is our r. So r, we can see that we've got r here. The hypotenuse squared is equal to the other two legs squared, so 17 squared plus 19 squared. We work that out, so we've got r squared is equal to, I'll take the square root of both sides, and eventually we work this all out, 17 squared plus 19 squared, and it simplifies to r equals 5 root 26. And you could probably get away with putting that in a decimal form if you wanted, but exactly what it is is r equals 5 root 26. Next up, let's figure out what alpha has got to be. Well, since alpha is in here, we see that tan alpha is equal to who is the opposite? The opposite away, opposite from that angle is 19. So 19 divided by the adjacent to that angle is 17. So divided by 17, we take the arctan of both sides. Alpha is equal to the arctan of 19 over 17. Now, that doesn't come out to be any friendly, nice form. That's not a really nice number to have to deal with. But if we punch it into a calculator, it'll wind up coming out as to be approximately 0.84. If we wanted to have it absolutely perfectly, we would have to leave it as tan inverse of 19 over 17. But we can probably have a decimal approximation. So alpha is approximately equal to 0 0.84. We'll probably do for our purposes of answering this question. Now, how do we get to the actual answer? Well, we have to figure out how does theta and alpha relate? Well, if we did a spin here, we could do one entire revolution. One entire revolution would be 
2 pi. So we see that theta combined with alpha, right? If we spin most of the way, and then we have the angle that we do in the triangle, well, that comes out to be one entire revolution. One entire revolution is 2 pi. So that means that theta plus alpha, in this case, comes out to be 2 pi. As we saw in the previous one, it came out to be pi. So we really have to pay attention to the picture we're looking at. There's not just a simple formula here. It's think and use pictures. Pictures and thinking. Without thinking, nothing will wind up working. Theta plus alpha equals 2 pi. What's our alpha? We have our alpha is 0 0.84. So theta plus 0 0.84 equals 2 pi. Actually, let's write it a little bit differently. I'd prefer to write it as theta equals 2 pi minus alpha, then we'll substitute in. So we have theta equals 2 pi minus 0 0.84, which gives us theta is approximately equal to, plug in 2 pi, 2 times 3.14 minus 0 0.84, we get approximately 5.44 for our value here. So that means we could plot the point as being 5 root 26, right? Our r value over here of 5 root 26 and comma uh, 5.44. Oh, sorry. Theta comes out to be 5.44. So 5.44. That's what we wind up figuring out as our approximate value. If we wanted it precisely, we could leave it as 2 pi minus tan inverse of 19 over 17, but we'll probably wind up being okay with just having this approximate value right here of 5.44. Now, we didn't do this in the last problem, but I want you to see that you can also check your work here. If you're not quite sure that it all came out right, we can check our work. We can go to um, polar, but then since it's so easy to convert from polar back to rectangular, we just plug them in. Remember, to convert to rectangular, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. So I will put in the middle the sort of checking box. So if we want to do a check, well, x equals r cosine theta, so that means x is equal to, what's our r? Our r is 5 root 26, so 5 root 26 times cosine of 5.44. We plug that into a calculator and we wind up getting x is equal to 16.96. What did we have originally? We originally had 17, and remember, we wound up having some round off error because we had to round because it was tan inverse of 19 over 17, so we rounded to 0 0.84. So that makes sense that we're winding up seeing 16.96 compared to 17. It's just round off error, but basically our answer is correct, so it checks out. Same thing for y. y is equal to r times sine theta. Our r here is 5 root 26, and our sine is 5.44. We plug that into a calculator and we wind up getting negative 19.04. Compare that once again to negative 19. The only thing we're seeing here is a slight bit of round off error. So this checks out because we knew that we'd have some rounding off error because we had rounded it as opposed to using what it was precisely. So if you're ever in a situation where it really, really matters that you wind up getting this right, like you're on a test or you're confused about how this stuff is working out, just wind up checking it. You Once it's so easy to convert from polar to rectangular, the hard part's converting from rectangular to polar. So if you're in polar, you might as well convert back to rectangular at the end and check and make sure that you got the answer right, especially if it really winds up mattering, like in a situation where you're taking a test or an exam of some sort. All right, so now that we've got a good understanding of how polar coordinates work, we're ready to talk about polar equations and functions, really get into the meat of graphing this stuff. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.